All right, I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 16. And I'm going to read the first five, ver first five verses. And actually, you're going to see that uh, this does fit in with what we've just heard uh, from Richie's testimony uh, without stretching it too much. But uh, we'll just begin in verse one. It says, then came he to Derby and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep uh, that, that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. And God will bless that short reading from his precious word. Uh, I want to just think uh, in this session, um, uh, if we'd have had the full time, we'd have been looking at three new things. Uh, but we're going to look uh, at one new thing here. Let me tell you what the three are. I was going to do verses 1 through 15. And I was going to look at a new recruit for the missionary team. Remember, they just uh, they just lost John Mark. Remember, they he'd bailed out of the, the missionary team and Barnabas wanted to take him and give him a second chance. And Paul didn't want him uh, on the team. And so there was a big bust up between uh, Barnabas uh, and Paul. And so they go their separate ways. Uh, Barnabas takes John Mark to Cyprus, and now Paul and Silas begin the second missionary journey, but they want another assistant, and they're going to get another assistant, and that's going to be Timothy. Timothy is going to be very significant because he's going to start out as an assistant, but he's actually going to end up as Paul's replacement. Not an apostle, but in a sense, he's gonna, Paul's going to hand over the work to him. <laughs> so amazing how this individual is going to be very significant. So we're going to think about this new recruit. Um, if we uh, had more time, next time we speak, we'll look at a new direction. And we're going to see uh, from verse six onwards, really, the guidance of the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit forbade them going in one direction, and then forbade them going in another direction, and then gave a clear vision of where they were supposed to go. By the way, it's a wonderful thing to know that the Spirit of God can guide us with direct clarity, just the same way today. It's good to know that. And so a new direction. And then we'll see a new convert to Christianity. Even though they had a vision of a man from Macedonia, uh, they go into Europe. And of course, this whole chapter is about the gospel going to Europe. But the first convert wasn't a man from Macedonia. It was a woman from Thyatira. It was actually a lady from Asia Minor, who happened to be living in Europe, who was the first convert. So that would be a new convert to Christianity. But for our purposes, uh, I want to just focus on this new recruit. So Luke tells us that uh, they uh, then came he, uh, of course, this is Paul and Silas, to Derby and Lystra. Now, remember, Lystra was the city where he had been stoned. Chapter 14. You imagine going back to a city where you had been stoned and left for dead. One thing we could say about Paul, he wasn't from Brooklyn, just in case. Uh, <laughs> but he was a determined individual. And he was wanting to go and see the Christians established that they led to Christ on their first missionary journey. And even though it meant going to a place where he'd been stoned, he went there. Which is amazing, isn't it, really? I mean, you got to uh, admire the courage. He, he was stoned and left for dead. We get that in chapter 14, verse 18 and 19. Most likely, a witness of that stoning and the incident that led up to it was a young man called Timothy. You say, how do you know that? Well, just keep your finger in Acts 16. I want you to go with me to... Second Timothy, Second Timothy, and if you've got a rhythm, a ribbon of some kind, keep it in there because we're going to go back to Second Timothy a couple of times in this message. But I want you to look at Second Timothy three, verse ten and eleven, 
And so he, he says, <clears throat> speaking, remember Paul is writing to Timothy here. And so he says in verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And I just want you to get this thought. He's saying to Timothy, you have fully known. And what did he fully know? My persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me. And then he says, at Lystra. That was when he was in Lystra and Derby. See, that was the same trip. And so the point is that most likely, Timothy was hearing Paul preached, uh, Paul preach, and also saw Paul stoned uh, and witnessed that event. He fully known these things. He knows all about them. So let's think a little bit about Timothy. And again, 2 Timothy is where we want to find some information about him because he's the subject of this little section. And 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, he said, Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee. That the idea unfeigned is unhypocritical. Right. Remember his story about the hospital and there was a lot of people claimed to have faith and they were they were just phonies. But this guy, Tommy Port, he was the real deal. He, he had unfeigned, unhypocritical faith. He was the real thing. And so Paul talks about Timothy now and he says, I remember the unfeigned faith that's in you. In other words, Timothy's a real guy. He's a genuine believer. There's nothing phony or fake about Timothy. By the way, isn't it good that we be real? God wants reality in the inward parts. He doesn't want actors. We've got to be real. God wants us to be the real thing. And so he, he remembers this, unfeigned faith. And then he says, that's in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I am persuaded that is in thee also. And so unlike the testimony you just heard, Actually, Timothy grew up in a really godly home. He had a godly grandma and a godly mother. By the way, that's a, a wonderful, if you grow up in a home like that, where your grandmother loves the Lord and your mom loves, thank God every day for that. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And Timmy grew up, Timothy grew up with that. And they had a profound influence on his life. Now I want to go a bit further, Ch chapter 3, verse 15. It says, And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so not only did he have a godly grandmother and a godly mother, and of course uh, we, we, we saw that, that they're Jewish, but it tells us in our verse in Acts 16, verse 1, uh, Timothy, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess, who believed, a Jewish woman who believed in Jesus. And so from a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. Again, you talk about privilege and blessing. Uh, it'd be much better to grow up in a home. We have a godly mother and a godly grandmother, and you're saturated with the Scriptures, than grow up in Manhattan Amen. in a drug neighborhood. This is much better. This is to be preferred. This is a tremendously privileged home. Praise God for that. But the interesting thing is that Timothy wasn't saved until Paul came to town and preached the gospel. I'm going to show you proof of that in a minute. But I want you just to see this, that it's possible to go up with godly parentage, godly grandmother, godly mother. Now, the, the dad was a, a Gentile. Uh, many believe he was dead uh, already at this point, uh, certainly had no spiritual influence on Timothy's life. It was just the granny and the mom. And again, isn't that amazing? God's grace, you know, I, of course, the, the perfect scenario is a godly mother and father, right? To, to raise, but, but it doesn't have to be that way. God still is able to work in the least perfect circumstances. And so they, they poured the scriptures into Timothy 
but but you you can pour scriptures into somebody from their their earliest childhood but there still has to be that moment where they personally trust in the lord jesus you cannot genetically pass the faith on from if you could all our kids would be saved and it'd all be going on with the lord but we can't do that they have to make a choice themselves there has to be a moment in time where they have to say yeah i believe what my grandmother and my mother have taught me and i believe that jesus is the only savior and i trust in him myself and we find that Timothy did that, but he didn't do it in the home. He did it through hearing Paul preach. You say, where do you get that from? Look at 1 Timothy now, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. It says this, unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 17. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. And so twice Paul tells us that Timothy is my son in the faith. What that mean? What does that mean? Paul will say elsewhere. He says, uh, you, "You, you, you have lots of teachers, but you don't have many fathers." Right. And the idea is this: somebody that leads you to Christ is your spiritual father. Tommy Port is the spiritual father of our dear brother Richie. He led him to Christ. Now, again, it was God that saved him. It was holy. But the person that had the privilege of actually sharing the word when he got saved was Tommy Paul. And he'll always have that relationship. And so, so Timothy, for all his upbringing, which was wonderful, he still needed to hear the gospel. And he heard it from Paul. And he believed it. That's why, by the way, yeah, we want to encourage every family in the assembly here to give the word of God to your children in your home. But it might not be you that has the privilege of leading them to Christ. It could be some visiting preacher that preaches the gospel that God uses as the final instrument in their salvations. And that's certainly what happened with Timothy. And so before we go any further in this little story, I get, again, I want to just encourage all of us that the importance of teaching the word of God to your children from a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation you cannot give your children a better heritage than pouring the word of god into their lives we we had a joy at this uh, men's conference there was an indian brother there and a very interesting brother and uh, he was talking about his father and he said that they and, and this is true i've stayed with many a south indian uh, family, uh, and one of the things that is common to every South Indian home, home I've ever been in is the family altar always happens. They are very faithful. And he was telling us about his dad. If they were traveling on a train, now you've seen maybe seen pictures of trains in India, <laughs> like third class. I mean, people just heaving together, just in one mass of humanity. And he said, if it was time for family prayer, his dad would do it right there in the middle of the train. It didn't matter to him what day it was, who was there, family altar is going to happen. And so, and he said, that he remembers as a child, his dad asking all of the kids to quote scripture verses, but always salvation. But quote John 3, 16, quote Romans 5, 8. Quote, and so he had them all. And so it turned, it turned into a gospel meeting in the train. <laughs> But he said, I've never forgotten my upbringing. And I will ever to this day, he said, thank God for my father's commitment. And he said, even when my father was with, my mother would do it. And they always had family devotions. Let's encourage this. We want to see that. But we also need to recognize, as well as the importance of 
being a godly influence on not just on your children by the way remember this is not just this is Eunice and uh, and Lois the grandmother as well be a godly grandmother right it, pour your lives into your children you cannot invest better for eternity than pouring the word of God into their lives. I want to just encourage you to do that, to really think about, this is really critical. Yeah, and, and so uh, we, we need to sec recognize that. But then just something else I want to just bring out of this, just as a, a kind of a simple point. But, you know, it's interesting that on, on face value, Paul's visit to Lystra on the face of it seemed a disaster on that first missionary journey. If you remember this, the story, they uh, they healed a man, and and the people in in Lystra thought they were gods, and they began to try and worship Paul and Barnabas. And then when Paul said, "No, we're just men like 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 you," and then the Jews came in and whipped up the mob, and they stoned him and left him for dead. It really seems like it was a pretty a disaster that trip. But out of the ashes of what seemed to be failure, it seems that Timothy <laughs> got a real heart for God during that trip and and i found sometimes when, when i've been on trips or whatever and it seems like it was a real wasted trip you find out later that somebody's life was touched it might be a long time afterwards somebody was deeply affected by what was said and so we, we can't just judge on outward appearances sometimes a disaster can actually i guess what i'm saying is this god is really good at bringing beauty out of ashes He's really good at that. And so here, there's something beautiful. Timothy, who's going to really be a key instrument in the rest of our New Testament, he's, he's a result of this trip to Lystra. And so it's wonderful to see that. So to Derby and Lystra, and there, there's this, this Timothy. And, um, and of course, notice it says uh, in verse 2, it says, Concerning Timothy, which was well reported of the brethren, or by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. And so just it's just good to, to remember this, isn't it? That um, Why was Timothy picked out? Not just because he was saved. That's wonderful. But he also had a good report amongst the brethren. Isn't it good to have a good report amongst the brethren? Not every Christian has a good report amongst the brethren. <laughs> Some names you mention, and it's like a stench in their believers. <laughs> but they're not, they don't have a good report among the brethren. They can be awkward, cantankerous, cranky saints that are difficult to deal with. And, and you know, kind of, uh, yeah, th those kind of people. So do we have a good report among the brethren? And how do you get a good report among the brethren? How did Timothy, in the time between his conversion and the time of this second missionary journey, something five years have gone by, how did he get this good report? Well, how you get a good report is by obeying the word of God, by letting the word of God change your life, by being affected by scripture. That's how you get a good reputation responding to light timothy uh, all this by the way all this scripture that had been put into him prior to his conversion boy that's not wasted it's amazing how that suddenly just comes with you've almost like you've, you've all loaded the database already <laughs> all that's needed is the spark of conversion and suddenly it all comes together <laughs> and so so he's he's responding to light he's allowing it to transform his life and of course, to, to do that takes humility. We have to recognize we need change. That, that's the prerequisite, really, for growing spiritually, is to realize I haven't arrived. And conversion, conversion didn't get me there either. It got me a good start, a wonderful start. But I have to continue to respond to truth. And as I respond to truth, truth begins to shape you as a person. Shape your values, shape your, your behavior, shape your conduct, shape your attitudes, and you begin to be transformed by Scripture, and all of a sudden you, you've got a good reputation. Because, hey, this man's serious about the Word of God. It's affecting his life. And one of the greatest turnoffs of Christianity is that a lot of people 
who are saved, claim to be saved, but they don't seem to be much different. And of course, and you hear people tell their testimony and you say, I really want to believe you. I'm not a skeptic by nature, but boy, it's hard to see much change, much difference. Timothy, you could see a change. He's got a, he's well reported of by the brethren with Lystra and Iconium. Of course, uh, somebody who's going to be an elder, 1 Timothy 3, 7. He has to have a good report amongst the brethren. You wouldn't ever want to put a person in leadership who is not well reported of the brethren. That would be a disaster. And so it's important to have a good report. And it's good to ask ourselves, how, I wonder how do the brethren view me in this assembly? It's a good question to ask. Do I have a good report? <laughs> Am I considered faithful, consistent, a loving person? God's word is affecting my life. Is that how I'm viewed? Notice verse 3, and this, this really kind of seems to be a strange verse. It says, him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those quarters where they knew all that his father was Greek. Well, it's not long ago, we we're in Acts chapter 15, and they were having a big battle over the fact that circumcision is not necessary for salvation. So why is he doing this? He withstood the Jews who were teaching believers they needed to be circumcised. Seems almost a total contradiction. It seems that Paul's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Chapter 15, he's going to fight to the death. The circumcision is not necessary. Here we are in chapter 16. He takes Timothy and he circumcises. Well, the difference is, in chapter 15, we're talking about Gentiles. Timothy had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother, which made him what? Jewish. And we see here, because of the Jews, circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. Father's a Gentile, that's one thing. But if, if for all the godliness of the mother and grandmother, if he wasn't circumcised, he would not be accepted in the synagogue. Why is that so important? Well, because the place that Paul goes first, usually when he visits any city, is the synagogue. Why does he do that? Because they've got two thirds of the story. All they need is the rest of the story, right? Uh, they've got they've got so much light, but they don't have all the light. They don't have the New Testament light that they needed. And so, if he was taking Timothy with him, who would be considered an apostate Jew because he's not circumcised, then Paul the rabbi suddenly has no street credibility at all. If I were to listen to this man, he hangs around with an apostate. We better get this fixed. Okay, so he certainly he's not contradictory at all. What he's trying to do, and just look at First Corinthians nine. This is a key verse in understanding this. First Corinthians nine, verse nineteen. It says, "For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself a servant to all, that I might gain the more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, that I may I might gain the Jews." To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law as without law, be not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became as I, I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker thereof with you. So what does he say? Timothy we got to take care of this. We, we want to get a hearing amongst the Jews with the gospel. And if I carry you along with me, who is a Jew and not circumcised, we won't get a hearing. we got to do this. When it came to Titus, Galatians chapter 2, they wanted to circumcise Titus. He was a Gentile. Paul says, not on my watch. You're not going to do that. <laughs> no way you're going to do that. And so it was because he was a Jew. And so in order to... Um, reach the Jews. And so Paul has this desire to reach them. Look quickly, verse 4 and 5, our time is just about gone here. It says, And so were the churches, so verse 4, as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. So as they go through these cities, what were the decrees about? The decrees, Acts 15, 
that when somebody's saved as a Gentile, they don't have to become a Jew. So he hasn't changed. It's just that Timothy is Jewish. That's the difference. And so he, he's delivering. So he has not changed one bit in verse five. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. And so again, this idea of that, that seeing churches established, seeing believers established. And of course, Timothy is going to be a key individual in future churches, establishing them in the faith. And so here's a, a wonderful, wonderful person that God is going to use in a marvelous way. And so uh, how do we wrap all this up? Well, just simply this. Um, we, we just want to encourage all of us to think about the, the blessing of putting the word of God into children. Because our culture is not going to do that. It's not. It's going to put lies into your children. So put the word of God into them. Give them the scriptures. Be faithful in that. And then for all of us individually, just ask ourselves the hard question. Am I well reported of by the brethren? It really matters. It does to have a good reputation amongst the saints. To have a good reputation. And how do I get that? Well, just by complying, being obedient to the word of God. And then just to say this, that you can have a lot of scripture from your childhood, but you still have to put your personal faith in the Lord Jesus. All mommy and daddy's upbringing and all the rest of it can save your soul. Only Jesus can save your soul. He's the only savior. You must trust him personally. And so may the Lord bless these thoughts. And again, what a contradiction. And just, I want you to see this, that, that God can use somebody saved out of a drug lifestyle but God can equally use somebody saved out of a Christian home who never knew anything about cocaine. <laughs> but he still needed to be saved. Everybody needs to be saved on the same basis. Christ died on Calvary's cross for religious sinners and rotten sinners. He died for every kind of sin. <laughs> and he's the only Savior. Is he your Savior? We've got to ask that question. Are you sure that you're sure? Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for uh, just the word of God. It's so real, so practical. Uh, we just pray again. Pray for the families connected with this assembly as they seek to establish a family altar. We realize it's, it's challenging, Lord. Our days are busy. The distractions are endless. But Lord, help them to be faithful in establishing a family altar and pour into their children the precious word of God. Lord, we'd love to see multi-generational families in this assembly where one generation after another, through faith in Christ, follows the Savior. And Lord, we pray for those that have grown up in a Christian home and yet right now are still far from you. And we won't give up on them either because we know that that Word of God sown in their hearts will not return void. And so we pray, even today, wherever they are, if they're, if they're wanting to be as far away from Christ as they can be, Lord, we realize your word says, where can I flee from your spirit? And the answer is nowhere. So we ask you to pursue them even today. Bring back to their remembrance scripture verses, Christian hymns that they sung, messages they heard lord work in them to bring them back we'll give you the glory in the name of the lord jesus christ amen, amen.